You're live. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, emerging session. We're going to tell you a little bit about PetBits and the Open Our Pet Project. Yeah. Uh, we're several people right now on the screen. And because I want to screen share the presentation, we're going to have some people off screen until we're done with the presentation. We'd love you to ask questions throughout in the chat or through the ask a question function. And the guys will monitor it <laughs> and interrupt me so we can answer questions right away. So please don't hold back at all. And then uh, the presentation will be relatively short. <clears throat> Let's say uh, 10, 15 minutes, if even. And uh, afterwards, we'll have a lot of time for questions and for actually uh, interactions in a little panel discussion. So let me just get started. And for the ones of you that actually don't know me, maybe I should have said that in start. I'm Melanie. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Copenhagen. But I'm also a researcher at the Neurobiology Research Unit at Ries Hospital, which is the national hospital in Denmark. So if you look at the post emission tomography, there have been some controversies. We all know, I mean, we're at OHBM, we know the rise of fMRI has, you know, generated a lot of interest. And uh, back in uh, 2014, Paul Cumming uh, published a commentary that basically stated, well, is PET neuroimaging dying? So will the white elephant pack his trunk? And he actually got quite a lot of <laughs> pushback on his uh, statement. Uh, Beyond that, by some of our really big guys in the PET neuroimaging field, Roger Gunn and Eugene Rabiner, that uh, basically told him, okay, especially looking at the rise of PETMR and the unique features that, that PET can do, this is not going to happen in the short run. And also uh, 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 here in Denmark, the head of our uh, Danish Center for Magnetic Resonance, Hard Hardwick Siebner, um, <clears throat> came back with a statement. And here they also looked at the publication records and actually showed that the way that Paul Cumming had looked at PET papers and evaluated the publication rate of PET versus fMRI had been a little bit faulty. And that's maybe why he could come to his conclusions. So that's the, the ongoing uh, PET controversies. And yes, PET is alive and, and well. And I'll tell you a little bit about it and what we're doing in the PET field right now. So first of all, PET is much more than clinical scans with FTG. While FTG has a huge place, especially in the clinic for oncological purposes, we can do so much more with PET. So with PET, you can visualize and also quantitatively measure the function of processes in vivo. And that is something very unique. Um, already in 2007, there was a big review article published by Bob Innes from the uh, NIMH as lead author that came up with a consensus nomenclature for in vivo imaging of uh, reversible binding radiologins. And here we have a subfield of, FET that, of, of PET that does uh, uh, radioligand imaging, so specifically uh, pharmacological modelings. And here it was one of the first steps to actually even agree on what is binding potential? How do we define binding potential? And that already happened in 2007. Now, since then, a lot of time has passed, but we haven't evolved so far in the pet field with respect to the crisis that is upon us, which is the issue of replications. In pet, we notoriously work with small sample sizes. The reason for this is that pet is invasive, much more compared to fMRI. Cost-wise, it's also probably in our center, we pay about four times as much for one of our dynamic pet scans than we do for an MRI scan. So that also limits how much samples you can acquire. And therefore, <clears throat> we have kind of now come to the, to the point also in PET where we see that replication in science is what we need. And part of this is also that we need to be better at reporting our experiments and describing them in our publications. And then additionally, share the primary research data. And in 2020, um, a bunch of the PET experts got together and there were working groups were made, for example, radiochemistry, um, pre-processing, uh, kinetic modeling, and all of those working groups reported back. And 
on the basis of this, the guidelines for the content and format of pet brain data and publications and archives was built. And this was really a community effort that was started way back at the neuroreceptor mapping meeting in 2016. And since then, has then over the years evolved to this paper. And following this paper, or I would say in parallel with this paper, uh, other work has been going on. And this other work has focused on the brain imaging data structure or bits. And a lot of you guys here I know are already BITS experts, but I wanted to make sure to state for the ones of you that are new to BITS that it's just a data structure. It's It has nothing to do with a new imaging format, format or something like this per se. So it's basically about how you organize your data, how you name your files, so they're machine readable, the names, how you document your metadata, and how you use appropriate community standards. It, you can read all about this on the BITS website and we're having a bunch of bits posters uh, at OHBM. There are still some uh, uh, sessions in the OSR that will also be concerned with bits. And we had the bits town hall last night. So lots of bit stuff going on. And what we then basically in parallel with the guidelines paper worked on was the development of the pet bit standard. Yeah, if you can access posters. Good point, Cyril. Um, and here we have a little bit of difference in PET experiments compared to, let's say, your standard MRI experiments. And the reason for this is simply time. In PET experiments, we're injecting a, a, a radioactive substance into the person. So this actually means we need to be very, very careful with how we deal with time because we need to account for the radioactive decay. So this is why time was a bit uh, of a crucial issue in our development. That's why in all our standard, it's very important that you define a time zero. So that means either you set it to the injection time, so when the uh, tracer is actually entering the human body, or to, for example, scan start. In rare cases, it could also be to, for example, the point of a pharmacological intervention. But that time zero concept is very crucial in the pet bits because everything needs to be aligned to this time zero. And compared to a... Uh, uh, MR and especially fMRI, there's also a little bit of difference in how we do dynamic PET, where you, a lot of you have probably worked with a more static PET image. So for example, FDG, you usually maybe take, let's say as an example, you take two five minute frames and you just average them and calculate some standard uptake value or a standard uptake value ratio. Now, when we do dynamic PET, what we do is we chunk our acquisition in different frames. They could range, for example, in one of our SIMI36 scans from starting with only varying five or 10 seconds to at the very end of the scan spanning five minutes. And a whole acquisition can easily span 90 minutes in total. So this means your whole structure of your four dimensional um, PET image looks a lot different than what you're used to from, from for example, fMRI. And then, of course, additionally to the image in PET, not in all cases, because this is, again, very, very invasive. Um, but in some cases, especially when we are trying to validate tracers or when we're doing pharmacological interventions, we also are acquiring blood data. And here we often acquire blood from the subject and then run it through an auto sampler or draw additionally manual blood samples and then we also often calculate a, what we call a metabolite pair infection. And all of this, again, needs to be corrected for the radioactive decay to the time zero. So that's a crucial part here. And how does this now look like our pet bit standard? Well, basically, if you look here in the middle, this is a, a regular bits folder structure with a study folder. And underneath, you have your participants, TSV, and so on. And then under a subject and session, in this case, we have, for example, in the data set description, you have your, your usual things. For example, here it would be related to which, uh, which data set we're working with. It's an AC data set. Um, we're acknowledging the paper where this was acquired. Uh, and for example, also our funding. And then you go down into the pet folder. And here you have a pet JSON, which is giving you all the general information about your pet experiment. This is regarding the type of scanner, regarding the type of radio ligand you're using, um, how much uh, megapackerel were injected, all this kind of general information that we need for the, for the uh, image processing is in there. And then accompanied of the JSON is, of course, the actual data. Here we have it in a, in a SIP Nifty. 
And this is now our time activity curves of the pet. So uh, there was a crucial discussion in the pet bits at the very start because, so going back to the physics of, of it all, we in, in pet, we inject a radioactive substance in your body. And then we basically put you in a tube and then we let you glow. And with some uh, photomultiplier tubes, we're just counting events coming from your head. And this is what, the actual raw data of a PET scan is the list mode data or the event data. And uh, we made a conscious decision. This list mode data is very, very large um, to basically share image data. So, so to say that our PET bits data is also in nifty format. Originally of the scanner, and we'll get into this later in our discussion, it usually comes in ECAT, which is a proprietary Siemens format, or DICOM of the scanner, but not the uh, list mode. So this is your image that you have here. And then additionally, if you have drawn blood samples, you have some JSON and TSV files. In the JSON files, you have, for example, for the manual and the auto sampler, uh, information regarding how the blood sampling was performed and some yeah, details about this. And in the accompanying TSV file, you basically have a, a tabular file where you have the time of the blood sample and then all the columns you need, for example, here, plasma radioactivity, whole blood radioactivity, et cetera. And with this, you can basically do all your arterial modeling. And then finally, very, very often nowadays, almost always, we have an MR that accompanies our PET. It does not need to be from the same machine. For example, locally, we image on a, a Siemens HRT, our PET images, and then we scan on the Prisma at the side for our MR. Um, but you could also have it uh, from a PET MR so it doesn't really matter if it's acquired on the same machine or not. Could be uh, in different spatial uh, orientations, for example. And that pet bit standard has basically been merged here in the spring. We're very happy about that. And recently, we also put a preprint out that is, uh, and Martin should say yes or no, is by now submitted or not uh, for publication. Uh, he's still fiddling with the with the online system to actually submit it for publication. But this is already out there and maybe one of you guys can share the, the bio archive link in the chat. Um, and here we try to really detail all the steps. And besides this, we have taken this a little bit further now already. So most of you guys already know about OpenNUR, right? It's basically the official repository for the Brain Initiative and it's funded through 2023. Um, and it has a lot of public data sets online, about 16 terabyte. We have 10 to 20 new data set uploads per month, and we have a lot of downloads per month and a lot of users. And we thought we should uh, capitalize on this, especially in our field pet where sample size is an issue. And hence, we are going to step further to open our pet. And basically, we want to establish the pet archive as an extension of open neuro with the standard format pet bits and the content that is described in the uh, guidelines paper, so regarding the experimental content you need in there. And additionally, we are working, and some of the others will comment on this later, uh, on best practices for processing pipelines and quality control. And our whole goal is to educate and seek feedback from the pet user community, because this is a community that has lived a little bit side by side with the regular, I would say, OHBM community. So we really would like to reach out and bring those two communities uh, um, closer together, especially because, for example, in our um, in our uh, research center here in Denmark, we have acquired quite a large database where we have, for example, PET, FMI, DTI, ASL, and structural MRI, of course, sometimes even also EEG on the same subjects. And those are unique data sets that we really want to share and also show to the wider community. And the principles will be, uh, as I just mentioned, our standard format and that we're following the papers. Our benchmarks of success will be that we would like to have you know, a growth of scans deposited. We already originally had 17 centers that committed to uh, deposit data. We'll see how that goes. And of course, we're going to hope that this will inspire a lot of also replication studies and thereby publications. And we really want to build a community here for the pet people. We want to provi provide help in curating 
collected or converting the data. Um, we want to integrate it with our uh, commonly used software. We have been in contact with two of the major companies, um, PMOD and also the Meerkat product regarding, uh, yeah, I would say compatibility of their products with pet bits. Um, but also have reached out to the open source developers of pet software, such as pet server or um, for example, the, um, uh, now I forgot. I'll get back to which one is, or Martin can link it in chat. Anyways, our setup right now, and here I wanted to make a special shout out to, shout out to the Global South. Our setup right now is very spread uh, around the Northern Hemisphere. So I wanted to also take this opportunity and especially reach out if you're sitting somewhere in the Global South, at least in the Southern Hemisphere somewhere, and you have pet data and you need help either analyzing it or you want to share it, reach out to us, please. Um, we, have, we, we know we've visited pet centers before in Brazil, so I really want to fill this map up all over the place. So uh, just uh, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. And in general, our open uh, NeuroPet setup is actually uh, in two parts. We have an American side, where Robert Innes is the PI, and this is uh, funded through the Brain Initiative. Um, and here they're uh, collaborating with us in Denmark, but also have, of course, uh, Ross Poldrick and the Open Neuro team as consultants on. And then at the same time, we have a European side that focuses especially on the GDPR compatibility uh, of this whole endeavor. How can we make a real European side of this that is GDPR compatible? This uh, uh, was uh, granted by the Novo Nordisk Foundation to our PI at the Neurobiology Research Unit, Kitimus Knusen, and just started earlier this year. And here we're again collaborating with the others uh, and getting feedback from the Open Neuro experience. And our ongoing work is what we now want to discuss with you guys, um, especially Anthony on screen can tell you a little bit together with Paul that we hopefully will also get on later about the BIT starter kit and the uh, what we have there now in terms of documentation to convert data sets to bits and how to build the required bits metadata text files from a pet data set. And then uh, Cyril and Martin can say something on the status of uh, converters. And uh, Martin can also point you to or uh, say a little bit about different types of examples we've tried to come up uh, with respect to sharing, you know, common pet experiments and what they could look like and how a bits file for an experiment like that could look like. That's basically it. Thank you so much. Thank you to all uh, my collaborators. It's been a blast to get this uh, pet bits through, especially thank you to Martin, who has been basically my wingman all the way through. And he's taking over now with the bits, the, the uh, bits pet derivatives, where I'm taking a step back. So I think uh, we have quite a ball rolling and I'm looking forward to discussion, please. Ask questions. Cool. cool. Adam is back on. Happy back. Welcome back, Adam. Nice job, Nomi. Really excited about Thank the Thank you. <laughs> So maybe, Anthony, do you want to start and tell them a little bit about the Bit Starter Kit? Uh, yeah, so uh, recently updated the Bit Starter Kit uh, to correspond with the uh, BEP, or do we call them BAP? Do you guys call them BAPs? Uh, BAP, going, BAP 009 going through. And so there's a, um, let's get a, a link for it. Basically put in a, a how to convert from a just a, a regular pet data set in ECAT format, I believe it's ECAT, uh, into a compliant bids nifty data set and uh, I would uh, advise you maybe don't don't try it just yet uh, you can look at it but it's very difficult and that's partly why we're um, working so much on these converters uh, because yeah it's just uh, it's not quite there yet and the ecat is a uh, if you're a Siemens engineer in the audience uh, please please come forward and announce yourself because uh, I would love to talk to you <laughs> about ecats um, but yeah, right now we're just uh, we're documenting how we can use our current tools and methods to process stuff, and in the same time, uh, how to yeah. And this panel's about building converters and making the process easier. But um, right now we're just uh, just adding on and informing people. And at some point, you know, well, presently, 
uh, move things further down the line and make it easier. Um, yeah. Ah, cool. And I wanted to have Paul up as well, but a uh, uh, big power, shout out to Paul. So Paul uh, is going to uh, work on also building some of the software, some of the Bits apps. He's uh, quite experienced experienced working with uh, Nord Docker. So he's going to then do basically where the converters are one side of the story. He's going to focus on the processing. So once you have a pet Bits data set, how do you process it? So yeah. I'll, I'll uh, tell you in a second uh, if we can switch around. But then maybe we could quickly have uh, um, Martin and Cyril tell the others something about the status of the converters and our obstacles. <laughs> well, while you're talking, maybe uh, people could uh, type in the chat um, if they're if they're pet users what their primary software package is. Are you using SPM? Are you using Pet Surfer? Are you using PMOD? Uh, we'd be interested to know what what kind of software is out there. But 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 while they're typing that, go ahead, guys. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, at the moment, uh, pretty much the same, but uh, from the MATLAB side. So we're trying to, in terms of converter, have similar things running both MATLAB side, Python side, uh, you know, so which is typical things in bits. Uh, so we want to be able to, to, to have the same tools so that uh, anybody can use their favorite language yeah, and be able to convert things. Uh, the human produce music. Take on data. Uh, I don't think there are music, right? Coming out of the uh, advance? No. If I understand uh, if I understand correctly what you mean by mosaic, but no. Well you know on the on the MR the data come out as mosaic, so you get all your uh, on the same dicom of your slices together and you just have to restyle them. Yeah, I'm not sure how they come of our of our PetMR because they come as one. F so when we export it from our PetMR, then uh, right we have you, let's say we have 36 frames. Um, then as far as I know, when we export it, right, we get a, a big dump with all the individual uh, with all the individual slices, and then we do resort like which one is to which frame. So if that, what do you mean by uh, by Mosaic. Yeah, and, and maybe I can take over a little bit on the on the converter side as, as well. Um, so one of the major like challenges that we have is that you know um, we have all this information um, from both blood data and. Uh, radioactivity and so th so on, uh, radio pharmaceuticals, and that data is not always available in the DICOM data or in the imaging data. So often you would have that in an external document, and for obvious reasons, it's very different how different pet centers will would go ahead and store that. Uh, so it's definitely challenging to to build like a, a common converter or a generalized tool. Uh, but we are really interested in in getting in touch with with people and seeing how they're you know storing this this information uh, because just what we've seen so far it's very different from from site to site. Um, but I think at at every time we see a new way of doing it, it really teaches us or how it can be done. Uh, so it will just be a major help if if, if we could get more people involved and they could share this. Um, so I can say at least for uh, the Copenhagen side, um, we're uh, well ahead trying to convert uh, the SIMPI database, which is a large uh, PET MR uh, and other uh, imaging uh, types to database. Uh, we have about a thousand subjects. Uh, and for now we've converted about 400 of these uh, scans. Uh, maybe we can put a link to the SIMPI database in the chat as well. Uh, so we are interested in, you know, making sure that if we want to go out and, and, and say we have this data, we also want to make, want to make sure that, that it's in the right format. Um, so again, at least we're, we're trying to do it at in the Copenhagen, but um, yeah, really looking forward to start working with other centers to, um, to try to help them do this in the best way.
and then maybe also uh, uh, now since since Paul is not here, um, Martin, could you could you mention something about the processing pipelines? That would be the next step. So right, first step is getting the bits or getting the getting the bits format to work. So converting our raw data, be it now ECAD or DICOM, and all the meta information from the blood into bits. But then the question is, when we once we have it there, we need tools to process it. So Welcome. what's our state Why don't you there? Why swap me and Paul just for this this bit, just so that uh, Paul can chime in if he wants. Yeah, I'll duck out real quick. No, I can duck out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, first of all, thank you so much to Gabriel for for sharing um, uh, the SPN based toolbox. Um, uh, that has been used there. I mean, again, so it's very different from site to site, what kind of processing they're using. Are they using SPM, FSL? Uh, same issues that we have for, for MRI and functional MRI, you know, other types of, of MRI as well. And um, I guess the problem for now, at least in the in the pet field, is that we have quite, we have not really reached this the point where you know we can set up a Docker container and run everything uh, in a fully reproducible manner. Um, most, at least that's my intuition, and, and I'd be happy to discuss it with if there's other points. Uh, but um, a lot of things are are done in MATLAB, um, and um, it is just you know trying to figure out how to use tools from from different software packages um, is in general a challenge, but. But we really want to try to, you know, streamline this in a, in a, I don't know if you can say a better way, but at least so it's more open. And um, hey, Paul, um, and and yeah, so so in general, trying to summarize a little bit better how people are are doing uh, their processing, um, and then trying to put that out there in a more streamlined fashion, so so people can use it, uh, independent on whether they want to use. Um, yeah, SPM or FSL or or Free Surfer. We just want to make sure that the tools are available, um, uh, so you can have a pet bits data set, and you could use, for example, uh, a bits app uh, that can do the pet processing, and that will give you a result. Um, but again, we don't want to force anyone to to you know like use one pipeline because uh, you can always discuss what's a good pipeline. Um, but we definitely want to try to make the tools. Uh, much more available um, because it's not always that that like these local tools are readily accessible. I think we have a question about PMOD in the uh, question and answer section uh, from Daniel Glenn. Uh, is PMOD still the software for modeling the radio pharmaceutical uptake? So it depends on which center you're using. So now we just uh, kicked Adam off, but when we talk to our colleagues at NIMH, they use it a lot. Um, and at NRU still, most of our clinical PhD students, they are used to PMOD, even though uh, what we usually do is, or our chief engineer has a very rigorous policy. He wants them to understand what they're doing. So he forces them to manually click through PMOD, at least for 10 subjects. And then afterwards, he scripts it all for them and runs it again, so he knows it's done. It's done right. But yes, PMOD is still very widely used. Yeah, it's 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 definitely still you know the pet tool that a lot of people are doing. Um, it's licensed, it costs money, and it's actually a pretty expensive license. And so, for obvious reasons, um, you know, people are more and more trying to you know like going toward their own tools. So there are also a lot of centers that, that go ahead and, and implement their own methods. Um, they're also available in PMOD. Um, and you know, as soon as you start doing that, you might introduce uh, variability or errors. Um, but yes, PMOD is still definitely one of the major uh, software packages for PET. And, and maybe I, if I can add to that, so we're also in contact with Pima, trying to have them, uh, you know, digest uh, pet bits, um, because they also want to make sure that, you know, whatever they have in their system when running Pima, uh, that all the necessary information is there. Um, we haven't heard from them in a while, uh, and the pet bits specification also just finished uh, or got merged. Um, but I'm pretty sure the goal is definitely to. Um, 
to have them more involved because um, yeah, they also have an interest in that. So I think at this point we should quickly mention, so because following this, uh, Adam said, uh, can we talk about the open source alternatives to PMOD? So I, I posted some of them in the chat and I'm sorry, Granville and Thomas, that I couldn't remember all the abbreviations before. But there is, the, uh, of course, the Kinfitter toolbox by Granville Matheson from Karolinska, now Columbia. He, uh, he has a R package that allows you to do kinetic modeling. That needs though tag curves as input. So you need to somehow extract your uh, tag curves. Um, then there is, of course, uh, also uh, um, Appian, the tool by Thomas Funk from McGill. And he uh, allows you to actually do the image processing or large parts of the image processing. Then we have our own partial volume correction tool at NRU called PVE Lab. We can drop that link in uh, maybe as well. And another tool that's very often uh, used for the pre-processing uh, is AIR. So these are some of the tools, but they're all used for different steps of the pre-processing tiles. tiles are, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Gabriel is coming. There are many toolboxes and in several languages, even with free server, it's possible to work with it. Yes. And actually, uh, the last couple of years, I have mostly been working with pet server since we, together with Doug Reef, developed it um, at NRU. Yes, and Martin also shared the link. Uh, like yeah, and, and maybe if I can just uh, add to that, uh, and and at least that's what we've experienced. But then, I mean, there will always be some tools that's missing, you know, whatever you want. Uh, maybe it's a specific uh, kinetic model or uh, some type of special motion correction or partial volume correction that you want to use. And then you want to go to a different software package. Uh, and then you, that is where you start, you know, like lumping things together. That's where it might not be clear from a paper uh, how things were done. Um, so it would be really nice if we could try to, you know, put all these things together in, a, in, a, in for example, MyPipe, which is uh, used uh, a lot. Um, but we also have to take care that, that, you know, again, a lot of pet users are MATLAB users. So we also want to make sure that, that you can do these things by using MATLAB. Yeah, you yeah, I think I can uh, jump on the questions of Eric and uh, Stefan. Um, so questions, uh, is there anything to fear regarding subjects real identification uh, for sharing pets? And uh, Stefan also uh, piggyback on what does that mean GDPR compatibility? Um, we haven't actually Touch much on what the pet friend re identification means, right? Um, but I mean, we treat uh, every you no know, imaging data the same. Right? We just uh, don't really make any difference, uh, assuming that you know, any image can be used to at least single out individuals that would feel that would fit into GDPR as prerequisite or pre step before identification. So better be safe and sorry just assume that you know this is personal plus anyway i mean bad data most of the time can be a lot of biomedical data so assume everything's personal and so in that case it means for gdpr it's full blown gdpr and the way we are dealing with it at the moment is uh, that we're developing a platform uh, so the data are shared uh, EU side on the, on the cloud, uh, most likely uh, Google Cloud. And, uh, you know, you can restrict, you can do ge geographical restrictions when you work on the cloud. So you make sure that it's based within the EU. You also say that you don't want uh, the 20, the 20 uh, round the clock, uh, 24 hours round the clock service, because that means that overnight the people from the US can touch your data. So you say, okay, forget about that service. Uh, just Want only EU people to touch the data, only on EU servers, blah, 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 all of this is sorted. Uh, then, I mean, uh, <coughs> the way we put that, each data set then as discussed in the open brain consent, you can Google it if you haven't seen this, and we can put that in the, in the chat. Uh, make Stefan, we know, because he co-wrote it with me. 
uh, <laughs> we also propose to use a data user agreement. So each data set will come with that. If you're outside, uh, outside Europe, you have to sign a, a standard contractual clause agreement, which is like uh, stuff for sharing in non-safe countries, such as the US, because it's well known the NIH is not safe. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> so you, you can't access our data. Um, and then, but all of this, of course, we want to do it through a platform, right? Some sort of click through the UA signing, this kind of thing. So what, what you spend time on is to register as a person. We make sure to know who you are. Once this is done, then each time you access a data set, you can click agree, click agree, and then access the data. So that's the kind of platform we want to do behind the scene. Of course, there's a lot of work to do so that the metadata are transparent on the neural and all of this uh, using data lab. So a lot of work to do with also people from data lab and uh, with Michael Anker. And Stefan, of course, with you if you want to join. Talk to Michael. And maybe we should quickly uh, 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 let Paul now talk a little bit about the NOR Docker and Pet Server yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pl plans, and then uh, we can take the more questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Whiten. I work at uh, the LCN at the Martino Center um, in the Free Surfer Lab. Um, so I'm working on getting up to speed with the, um, the this pet bid standard. Um, Lately, I've been working on trying to bring together all these tools we have for making bids data sets and pet specific data sets and converting from DICOM or ECAT. I'm trying to get that all into one Docker container for now. So we have like a single place to go to, to really try things out. Um, you know, a, a lot of different options uh, to do the same thing. Um, yeah, and then and then longer term, I'd, I'd like to write uh, 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 bid support, like or a bids app for Pet Surfer, so we can just take these bids data sets and if they have you know Pet and MR, kind of run it through Free Surfer in the recommended way. Um, and then I'd also like to see um, you know some NeuroDocker support. Neuro NeuroDocker is this tool um, that kind of brings together all um, neuroimaging related uh, software into one platform, so it's really easy to generate exactly the container you're looking for. Like, so if you want FSL and MATLAB and this Python and, you know, this nifty reg, let's say. Um, so it'd be really great to have sort of a bids tools sort of neuro Docker template so we could get, you know, all those sorts of great tools to create and then validate a bids data set into a container. So to make it even easier. Thanks Paul. And then, uh, so we're frantically typing stuff in the chat. Uh, one point I wanted to highlight that came up regarding the co-registration chat that I wanted, because it's a pet peeve of mine, I wanted to mention. So uh, when you work with MRI, and especially if you even work with just a, a structural MRI, or if you work with functional as well, usually you don't really care if your images are corrected for uh, gradient nonlinear, so if your image is still warped or not. And uh, you don't necessarily uh, uh, correct for this, and it depends also on the vendor. So in, in, in Siemens machines, you have the option to download or export an image that's corrected for uh, uh, gradient nonlinear, so see uh, unwarped, and, and one that is not. And uh, Philips and GE do that differently. Now, if we just go back to our physics, so in PET, there is no warping, right? It's real space. Basically, my head shape doesn't change when I'm glowing. I just glow. So hence, I need to be very sure that I'm unwarping my MR image to make it one voxel in MR space to be exactly the same spatial uh, amount as one voxel in my pet space. And that's actually something that not all centers do. And when you then try to align cortex, what you see, the difference between the MR that has been corrected or not is you see this elongation and this, of course, makes a difference when you're doing registration, especially when you're trying to align cortex. So that's one of the 
pet peeves that we have written into the specification that we actually added this flag, uh, made it uh, made it once you have a pet, we made it a, a, a mandatory flag in the MR to tell us is your MR corrected for gradient nonlinearities or not. And then maybe we can continue with the with the questions. Um, do one of you guys want to take the one on spec? Yeah, I can try to talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer. I mean, it would have been nice to also have had that as a part of the pet bits now, but I think um, for practical reasons, we decided not to include it for now, both because um, maybe we, we don't really feel that we have the right expertise to also bring in spec. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, um, yeah, that we also thought it, even though it's it's similar, it's not quite similar. Um, um, so that is why we, at least for now, decided not to include it. But the goal is definitely to to include it at some point. Um, as you uh, may know, there are also you know a lot of uh, combined PET CT scanners. Uh, CT is not a part of bits for now, but um, uh, Hugo. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. So uh, it's working on trying to, to finish this or at least get it uh, moving. Um, so the goal is also to bring in a CT uh, at some point. Uh, but again, have to start uh, uh, yeah, at, at one point. Cool. And then I think um, there was a follow up question by uh, Stefan in the chat that I just wanted to bring up. So, uh, are we concerned about buy in from distributed centers to use OpenNorPet to store their data? And maybe, uh, Cyril, you, you, you want to answer that? I know you did already in the chat, but uh, uh, I want to say expand a little bit on this and maybe also uh, what our ideas are in that direction. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, one of the issues that Stefan is raising is because, of course, each, you know, each center, when you've got uh, EU, EU from people who are not specialized in GDPR, is great because you have one law for, e, for EU, it's called GDPR. But actually, each country can do its own way. So actually, you don't have one law. You have as many countries, as, as, as many state members, and as, as many laws. And then if within each center, the data protection officer interprets more or less below their own way. So which means basically now you've got uh, as many versions of how I want to understand the law as your center, right? So that's what happened. And that's why we just uh, decided that the way we do it is simply, you upload your data with your data user agreement that you agree to your data protection officer. So the platform that uh, we are building is not we're not telling you what DUA you want. It's your DUA, it's your data. We're happy to help you to share your data. Right, so we can help you to convert your data. Uh, hopefully as time goes, we'll be able to provide more educational material. Uh, we're happy to host your data, uh, but you have to come up with your own DUA. It's your data, so you decide how you want to share it. Right, uh, so that, that, that way, also, it's nice because your data protection officer is happy. Uh, because, you know, it just depends on the law of your own country. Uh, and then we will provide the people with our platform uh, a DPA and by use of our tools, legal tools like this, so that uh, you, know, you get full information on how security is handled. Is of course, there's also some things that you would be required to do to share your data. But I mean, it seems largely feasible um, in terms of you know how the lawyers are seeing all of this. And the nice thing is because when you handle people from outside the EU as well, we sent a close agreement, which means we can Paul can pull up the data and run pet software, and you know we we can do a mega analysis. Assuming first we can convert the data properly. Uh -huh. 
It's 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 so easy. It's it'll be fine. Sorry, and I. But yeah, I, I would really encourage. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please, Anthony. Oh. Yeah, I, I would encourage any pet researchers to uh, get us any eCat data you have. Uh, it's all very valuable to us right now. Um, yeah, it's it's just an undocumented format by Siemens, uh, which we've got some documentation from. So it's just tricky, and uh, we're seeing all kinds of weird things with it. So the more we have, the better uh, Open Neural will be, or Open Pet Neural, and the better these tools will be as well. The more we're exposed to. So yeah, uh, push it our way if you got it. Yeah, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. I also just shared in a chat, uh, especially regarding the EU people, we just had a seminar here at the University of Copenhagen where we had the lawyers talk about the new EU Artificial Intelligence Act. My head of department, or head of section and head of department actually, uh, were quite concerned after they heard the, the lawyers give this talk. So I think maybe if more of us researchers, uh, you know, listen to some of the things that the lawyers say and think uh, i think that's very important because they're they're making the laws now for europe and uh, the fda has already uh, gone forward and um, put out guidelines for how to um, regulate medical ai and in the eu this will come as well and i can only imagine that it will be much more strict <laughs> here so uh, i think i would encourage all of the yeah, all of the researchers that can get involved, talk to them. The, the more we can explain things and, and yeah, how likely it is to re-identify someone from a single slice uh, that is published in a paper, um, that, is, uh, that is important to do and important work. Maybe one of the last thing we can do, Paul, can we make the switch with Adam real quick? Because I wanted to make a... Um, uh, so, Rokum, if you can, could switch Adam and Paul sure. real quick. I wanted, as the last thing, to give Adam a, a chance uh, to basically tell a little bit about the uh, NIMH database and the, and the hopes, at least, that we have for uh, being able to share some of the NIMH pet data as well. Um, because we're the Simbi database in Europe we have, but the NIMH has great troves of data as well. So if you're an investigator there, you know, try and reach out and uh, how we can, yeah, convert yeah. data and make it happen. Absolutely. So um, uh, as part of Martin's uh, project, he is trying to, uh, sorry about that, uh, trying to assemble a number of data sets to look at a particular question. One of them was collected at NIMH, so we have been chasing it down. The investigators who collected it uh, no longer work at NIMH, but it is still controlled under our protocol. So um, I just need to look at about 120 consent forms, but after that, <laughs> we will be able to get it out. So uh, yeah, if there's any NIMH intramural researchers out there, there are mechanisms to uh, free data that you think might be trapped. So please get in touch with uh, me or anyone on the data science and sharing team and we'll give you a hint. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, this was a very important point because we're really trying to get both sides of the of the pond here to work together. So. Uh, uh, please reach out to either the EU or the NIMH side if you need help in either converting your data to bits um, or, you know, getting your data shared via uh, Open Neuropet and yeah, the other consent forms. I know we all feel sorry for Adam and we're very thankful that he's going to put in that work. They're not actually um, physical. They're in, they're on a, they're on a digital screen. So it, it's, it'll be relaxing. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and if I may just also add, Melanie, um, just uh, a final one maybe on, on uh, the derivatives part of, of PetBits. Uh, so uh, please, Gabriel and others, uh, uh, reach out to me. Uh, we want to set up like a, a joint meeting um, in a couple of months where we'll try to talk about uh, different tool, tools for, um, for processing pet data and trying to, you know, like uh, capture or map out uh, what should go in a, in a pet derivatives. Uh, so please reach out so I can get your contact information and invite you to that. Uh, it will all be open. It's just, uh, it'd be nice to, you know, like have at least a list for myself. So 
I make sure that I include everyone who's interested. I guess I will just go ahead and do that. Uh, thank you. Cool. Um, and then if there are not any more questions, I think we want to finish with saying yes. Please go and check back on our website. Uh, we're, uh, we're really on GitHub, we're trying to fuse the links from the uh, the two institutions, the project web page. We will be uh, trying to uh, get our pet portal online soon. Yes, exactly. And Anthony was so great to make actually an email. Very efficient. Um, and yeah, please don't be uh, don't be has don't hesitate to reach out. We really want to help the community move forward. We're very excited to uh, work with either tool developers or people that sit with their data. Especially also if you're a more clinical PhD student and you don't know at all how to process your data, just uh, reach out and uh, we'll try to help because our goal is to make as much of this valuable pet data available to as many people as possible. So. Thanks, everyone. We've answered all the questions. The chat is slowing down. And now everyone can have a little bit of break before they sign off for the day or they actually continue with the rest of their working day. So thanks, everyone, for this nice session. <laughs>